I met a traveler from an antique land who said, To vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. During my sophomore year of college, I took an elective class on science fiction writing. It was a good class, I wrote some decent stories, and more importantly for this video, I read some good stories. The main textbook for this class was this, The Best Science Fiction of the Year, Volume 3, edited by Neil Clark. It's a collection of science fiction stories that came out in 2017. Two stories in particular have really stuck with me. Wind Will Rove by Sarah Pinkster, and The Martian Obelisk by Linda Nagata. Wind Will Rove received a Hugo nomination and a Nebula nomination for Best Novelette, while The Martian Obelisk received a Hugo nomination for Best Short Story. These two are actually right next to each other in the book, which is fitting because they share some themes. This is a video about stories that are linked, if not by author, but by concept. It is a video about stories about art. These parallels I found between the ways different writers have attempted to answer the same questions. By the way, I will be recapping these stories during this video and occasionally reading snippets, but I'd recommend you read both of them on your own first. The Martian Obelisk isn't very long, and it is a great read. Wind Will Rove is a bit longer, but I think it's well worth the time. There are links to both stories in the description. Now then, let's talk about art. takes place on a colony ship, slowly traveling towards a new planet. The story's narrator, Rosie Clay, is the daughter of one of the original colonists. By the time the story begins, Rosie is a grandmother. There are three entire generations on the ship who were born on the ship, all of whom will inevitably die on the ship. The central question Pinkster asks is, what does art mean to someone born on a spaceship? So much art is about things that Rosie has never experienced. Wind Will Rove, the central song the story revolves around, is about wind. But Rosie has never felt wind. She's never seen a sunrise or an ocean or a farm or a forest or a rooster. All she's ever seen is the spaceship. But she knows about the world the colonists left behind. She knows there are beauties out there she will never experience. All she has is the books and films and paintings and songs brought by the colonists, the memories they have of Earth. Rosie is a musician. She plays old folk songs on the fiddle every week, but they feel hollow because she and the rest of the crew have been separated from Earth for so, 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 so long. I never thought to ask her about the honeysuckle plant. To everyone else, it was simply the song's name, a name that meant this song, nothing more. When I started thinking that way, all the songs took on a strange, flat quality in my head. So many talked about meadows and flowers, and roads and birds. The love songs maintained relevance, but the rest might as well have been in other languages, as far as most people were concerned. Or about nothing at all. Mostly, we let the fiddles do the singing. If we were to only play songs about things we knew, we would lose a lot of our playlist. No wind, no trees, no battles, no seas, no creeks, no mountaintops, We'd sing of travelers, but not journeys. We'd sing of middles, but not beginnings or ends. We would play songs of waiting and longing. We'd play love songs. Why not songs about stars, you might ask? Why not songs about darkness and space? The traditionalists wouldn't play them. I'm not sure who'd write them, either. People on Earth wrote about blue skies because they'd stood under gray ones. They wrote about night because there was such a thing as day. 
Songs about prison are poignant because the character knew something else beforehand and dreamed of other things ahead. Past and future are both abstractions now. Rosie and the others cling to art, not just because art is enjoyable, but because they see that as the only way to hold on to their humanity. They keep singing old songs because it is the only way to hear the echoes of the world they left behind. The thing is, there are those aboard the ship who dream of silencing those echoes. Ten years into the journey, a programmer named Trevor Dubay released a virus that tore through the ship's media library, destroying everything, even the backups. Every book, every movie, every song, every game, every historical text, every holy book, every painting, every memento of home the journeyers brought with them was wiped out. They were left with nothing, alone in the void. Those pieces of art, their connection to humanity, were erased. All media became lost media. The journeyers were trapped in a never-ending blackout. There were attempts to recreate things. People rewrote books, re-recorded songs, remade paintings, recreated films. They did what they could to bring back what they had lost, but it wasn't the same. Perhaps the reason so many songs feel flat to Rosie is because they aren't the real versions. They're half-remembered imitations. After the blackout, Rosie's grandmother Wendy and her friend Harriet started the Memory Project. Children were tasked with memorizing two songs each and then passing them down. Biological storage, a bulwark against any attempts to imitate Trevor Dubay. Wendy chose to memorize and eventually pass down to Rosie two songs, Honeysuckle and Wind Will Rove. But early in the story, Rosie checks the database and discovers that Wind Will Rove is gone. All of this talk of lost media reminds me of another story, Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. It's that poem I read at the start of the video, the one that one good Breaking Bad episode is named after. Ozymandias tells the story of a traveler finding what remains of a massive statue, presumably built in front of some sort of palace or city. The statue is crumbling, but the sign on the pedestal is still legible. It contains the prideful words of a king named Ozymandias, bragging about his kingdom and his wealth. The irony at the heart of the poem is that this pedestal, this proclamation to look upon his works in despair, is all that remains. Behind it sits no palace, no kingdom, no monument to a king, just endless desert. Ozymandias is long dead and likely long forgotten by the people he once ruled over. His works have disappeared. All that remains is his pride. The story of Ozymandias heavily influenced the Martian Obelisk. The Martian Obelisk takes place in a world that is dying. Not dead, that would be too merciful. It takes place in a world without hope, a world that is slowly falling apart. The end of the world required time to accomplish, and time, Susanna reflected, worked at the task with all the leisurely skill of a master torturer. One who could deliver death either quickly or slowly, but always with excruciating pain. No getting out of it. It was not supposed to happen like this. As a child, she'd been promised a swift conclusion. Duck and cover and nuclear annihilation. And if not annihilation, at least the nihilistic romance of a gun-toting, leather-clad, fight-to-the-death anarchy. That hadn't happened either. Things had just gotten worse. And worse still, and people gave up. Not everyone, not all at once. There was no single event marking the beginning of the end, but there was a sense of inevitability about the direction history had taken. Sea levels rose along with average ocean temperatures. Hurricanes devoured coastal cities and consumed low-lying countries. Agriculture faced relentless drought, flood, and temperature extremes. A long run of natural disasters made it all worse. Earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. There had been no major meteor strike yet, but Susanna wouldn't bet against it. Healthcare faltered as antibiotics became useless against resistant bacteria. Surgery became an art of the past. Out of the devastation, war and terrorism erupted like metastatic cancers. We are a brilliant species, Susanna thought. Courageous, creative, generous as individuals. In larger numbers, we fail every time. There were reactor meltdowns, poisoned water supplies, engineered plagues, and a hundred other smaller horrors. The Shoal War had seen nuclear weapons used in the South China Sea. 
but even the most determined ghouls had failed to ignite a sudden, brilliant cataclysm. The master torturer would not be rushed. Still, the tipping point was long past. The future truncated. There were attempts to colonize a new planet, but all of these attempts fell apart, with the last colony, Red Oasis, being wiped out by disease nine months before the Martian Odyssey begins. The opening act of the story makes it very clear the world is going to end, and there is nothing anyone can do to stop that. The protagonist of Nagata's story is Susanna Lee Langford, an architect who has spent the past 17 years of her life building a monument atop the red sands of Mars, using the unused equipment of a failed Martian colony. The project is so immense that she still has six and a half years to go by the time the story begins. Susanna is 80 but clings to life so that she may see the end of her project, a project so monumental it will define not just her own life, but all of human existence. Susanna described her vision of the Martian obelisk, a gleaming, glittering white spire taking its color from the brilliant white of the fiber tiles she would use to construct it. It would rise from an empty swell of land, growing more slender as it reached into the sparse atmosphere, until it met an engineering limit prescribed by the strength of the fiber tiles, the gravity of the red planet, and by the fierce ghost fingers of Mars's windstorms. Calculations of the erosional force of the Martian wind led her to conclude that the obelisk would still be standing a hundred thousand years hence, and likely far longer. It would outlast all buildings on Earth. It would outlast her bloodline and all bloodlines. It would still be standing long after the last human had gone the way of the passenger pigeon, the right whale, and the dire wolf. In time, the restless earth would swallow up all evidence of human existence, but the Martian obelisk would remain, a last monument marking the existence of mankind, accepting only a handful of tiny, robotic spacecraft fairing, lost and unrecoverable, in the void between stars. It seems petty when the world is ending to focus on making a monument that no one will ever see. Susanna's financier, Nathaniel, is explicitly compared to Ozymandias. And yet, it's hard not to sympathize with Susanna and Nathaniel. They've dedicated themselves to this project, abandoning everything else because they see it as the only way for their lives to have meaning. The world is dying, Millions are dying. Humanity will soon be snuffed out. But at least Susanna's giving mankind a tombstone. At least there will be a monument on another world that says we existed. We were here. We mattered. Ozymandias comes off as a prick. But imagine if there was no pedestal. Imagine if there was no remnant of his kingdom, of the people who live there. Wouldn't that be sad? Wouldn't that be worse? Wouldn't it? Hatred of Trevor Dubay is not universal among the journeyers. There are those who see the blackout as a good thing. And that seems ridiculous. I just talked about how art was the key to the journeyers holding on to their connection to the Earth. The thing is, maybe it's good for that connection to be severed. Maybe losing their memories of Earth is the only way for the journeyers to move forward. I do sometimes wonder what would be different now if things hadn't gone wrong so early in the journey. Would we have naturally moved beyond the art we carried, instead of clinging to it as we do now? All we can do is live it out, but I do wonder. What is the point of songs about wind to those who will never feel the breeze? What is the point of memorizing the history of battles for the fate of countries three lifetimes away? Why learn about mountains if you can never stand atop a real one? Rosie is a history teacher, and the very idea of history is questioned by Nelson, one of her students. Nelson is, despite his young age, one of the most articulate characters in the story, and his arguments have merit. We don't have countries or oil or water or guns or swords or bombs. If teachers hadn't told us about them, we wouldn't even know they existed. We'd be better off not knowing that my ancestors tried to kill Emily's ancestors, wouldn't we? Somebody even tried to erase all of that entirely and you made sure it was still included in the new version of history. The old history can't repeat, and I'm in the next generation of people who make no impact on anything whatsoever. We aren't making history. We're in the middle of the ocean, and the shore is really far away. When we climb out, the journey should have changed us, but you want us to take all the baggage with us, so we're exactly the same as when we left. But we can't be, and we shouldn't be.
Maybe Rosie should stop teaching history. Stop replaying old songs. Stop clinging to a world she will never see. Nelson advocates she teach them practical skills like genetics and ship repair, things they need to keep living. And there is evidence that this dedication to the past, this obsession with preserving old art, is stifling to the journeyers. At one point, Rosie asked her friend Harriet about a song called Oklahoma Rooster. When Rosie plays this song, she imagines a farm. She imagines a blue sky and green grass and the crowing of a rooster. But when she asks Harriet about the song, all Harriet can say is the song's history. Rosie asks, how does this song make you feel? Harriet doesn't understand the question. She says, it's a nice song, but not good enough for the memory project. But who gives her the right? What gives Harriet, a woman who can't think about a song in terms other than a Wikipedia history synopsis, the authority to decide what art is worth remembering? At one point, Harriet tells Rosie that young musicians shouldn't write new music because they ought to be working on preserving the music they already have. Interestingly, Nelson is noted to be Harriet's grandson. This generational conflict over art appears throughout Windwell Rove. Rosie's daughter, Natalie, formed a band as a teenager and tried to make new music. Rosie's mother took things a step farther, abandoning her and joining a cult called New Time that wants to create another blackout. This disgusts Rosie, but her mother isn't motivated by a hatred of art. She thinks the journeyers have spent too much energy recreating the things they left behind. She wants new art, art about their lives in space, art that tells their story. The radical ideals of the New Timers force them to the fringes of the ship's society, an insular community that barely interacts with outsiders. This, Rosie feels, is a fatal flaw of their art. I don't know if I ever stopped being angry, really. I never went to any of their original plays that trickled out of the New Time. I never explored their art or their music. I never learned what we looked like through their particular lens. It wasn't new works I opposed, it was their idea that they had to separate themselves from us to create them. How could anything they wrote actually reflect our experience if they weren't in the community anymore? Her interactions with Nelson and the disappearance of Windwell Rove force Rosie to analyze her tangled past with her family and question if the new timers are really wrong. Interspersed throughout the story are snippets of entries in the ship's database relating to the song Windwell Rove. The first entry describes a 19th century Scottish ballad called Windy Grove, Lost to Time. The second describes Windwell Rove, a half-remembered recreation of Windy Grove made in the 70s. After the song goes missing, the reader is shown Rosie's grandmother's recreation, made after the blackout. Later, the novelette features Wendigo and We Will Go, two lost songs thought to be related to Windwell Rove, although no one is certain. After the memory project is explained, the novelette shows an attempt at recreating the original Windy Grove, a restoration of this song lost to time, now for the first time in the story, with actual lyrics. We went down to the Windy Grove, never didn't know where the wind did go, never too sure when the wind comes back, if it's the same wind that we knew last. As I said earlier, Rosie's daughter Natalie formed a band as a teenager and tried to create new music. Interestingly, Natalie firmly opposed recording any of her new songs. She didn't want her art to be remembered, logged into a database deemed worthy enough to be passed down throughout the generations. She wanted to find meaning, and that meaning is the song being forgotten, disappearing like tears in rain. The idea of art not being saved isn't a new one. A lot of forms of art are temporary. Performance art, cooking, unrecorded live performances, these things, by their very nature, are hard to copy. Most of all art and music from human history has been lost. Some artists even make their art ephemeral on purpose. Banksy, for example, paints things on public walls, where they are inevitably painted over. In 2018, he rigged a painting to shred itself after being sold at auction, destroying a painting that had sold for more than a million pounds. In 2005, Brazilian artist Nele Azevedo began her Melting Men series, collections of hundreds or thousands of ice statues left outside intended to melt away in less than an hour. These art installations have over the years been used to send messages about climate change and war. The meaning of Azevedo's work is intrinsically linked to the ephemeral nature of the medium. 
whether it be critiquing the needless waste of human lives through melting soldiers or the existential terror of climate change by showing that everything, even us, will melt away as the skies turn to fire. In my spare time, I DM tabletop role-playing games, and I have a lot of fun doing it, but something that always bugged me was how ephemeral it was, that I was working hard telling a good story, and all of it was lost to time, not shared with the world, not even remembered, because I barely remember some of those early games. So in 2001, I decided to start recording my D&D games. I created a D&D podcast, an original idea that no one else has ever had before. And it sucked. Not the show, the show was fine, but making it, making it sucked. Recording things, editing them, releasing these private moments to the world, it killed a lot of the fun. It forced myself and my players to play different, to think about every word, because it was transmitted to an audience. An audience of zero people, mind you, but an audience nonetheless. My players hated making the podcast, starting it almost killed my weekly D&D group, and I eventually had to cancel the show after 10 episodes. And we actually played a few more sessions in that campaign and didn't record them, and you know what? It was fun! Playing off mic brought fun back to our little D&D game. It brought back the fun I'd thrown away because I was afraid of art being lost. So maybe it's good for art to disappear. Maybe it's okay for stories to stop being repeated, for songs to stop being sung. Maybe only through being something that can be forgotten can art be meaningful. But I think about the lost media movement. Thousands of people who dedicate their time to digging up old pilots and lost commercials and rough drafts out of a steadfast desire to preserve art. Doesn't that have meaning? Or are all of those people foolish? Rosie eventually sneaks to one of Natalie's shows without her permission and hears her play. And as she listens to this new song, this show meant to be forgotten in the bowels of a spaceship, she recognizes a melody. She hears Wind Will Rove, the reborn version of a forgotten ballad, recreated after the blackout, passed down from generation to generation until it landed in Natalie's hands, unknowingly remixed into something new, into a song that will never be passed down. The night I saw Natalie's short-lived band perform, the night I hid in the darkness, all those years ago so she wouldn't get mad at me for coming, it wasn't until I recognized Windwell Rove that I realized I'd been holding my breath. Theirs wasn't a new time rejection of everything that had gone before, it was a synthesis. Afterwards, the book gives one more database entry, this time for a hip-hop song called Wind Will Roam that samples Wind Will Rove. Its lyrics are as follows. The wind will roam and so will I. I've got miles to go before I die, but I'll come back I always do. Just like the wind, I'll come to you. We might go weeks without no rain, and every night the sun will go away again. Some winds blow warm, some winds blow low. You and me have got miles and miles to go. All this talk of songs and wind, of lost media and half-remembered lyrics, do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the most mysterious song on the internet. That song I played during the title sequence. The most mysterious song on the internet was recorded on a tape recorder from a German radio station sometime in the 80s. In 2007, the song was uploaded online, and people began searching to try and figure out who recorded it. In 2019, this search turned viral. But despite 17 years of searching and thousands of collective man-hours, the song has never been identified. The song isn't actually called the most mysterious song on the internet, obviously. A lot of people refer to it as Like the Wind based off its first line, or Check It In, Check It Out after the chorus, but these names are unofficial. Personally, I like the name Like the Wind, and will use that name henceforth. Curiously though, the original tape listed it as Blind the Wind, based off a mishearing of the lyrics. And I say mishearing because Like the Wind is the general consensus interpretation, but the first line might actually be Blind the Wind. It isn't like we have an official lyric sheet. All we have is an old recording. The poor quality of the original tape and the fact that the singers probably aren't native English speakers makes the lyrics a bit fuzzy. Different lyric sites give different lyrics. Is it take the consequences of living or the consequences of leaving? Is it you're going somewhere or you're going to suffer? Is it restless dreaming or restless screaming? Is it 
or the sun will never shine, or or the sun will never die. Is it take it in, take it out, or check it in, check it out? Is it sense communication, or scent communication? It is likely the mystery of the most mysterious song on the internet will never be solved. Odds are, it was a demo that was sent into a radio station, played once, then thrown away. And yet, so many people have spent so much time trying to find the truth about this song, to find the person who wrote it. And part of that is because people like mysteries, but it's also because it's a genuinely good song. Like, setting aside the mystery of its creator, Like the Wind is a good song. I've listened to it a ton for this video, and every time I do, I enjoy it. People have remixed and covered this song because they enjoy it. And it's kind of sad that the creators of this song, some failed rock stars from Germany, will never know that people love their work, that their demo has been played millions of times. But I wonder, would we care about this song if we knew the band that recorded it? Would we care about Like the Wind if it wasn't the most mysterious song on the internet? Hell, I'm only talking about it because it's partially lost, because of the mystery. The mystery is intrinsically intertwined with the song. The mystery is what gives the song meaning. Like the Wind is almost a reverse Ozymandias. In Ozymandias, all that remains is the name of the creator. But with this song, all that remains is the actual work. Kind of like in The Martian Obelisk. The bulk of the Martian obelisk concerns a threat to the titular tower. A vehicle is driving across the red planet, coming from one of the devastated Martian colonies. Initially, Susanna and Nathaniel believe that someone has taken control of abandoned equipment, just like they have. They believe someone is coming to the obelisk to destroy it. This seems absurd, but years before the events of the story, someone did the same thing to a skyscraper created by Susanna out of spite out of anger, that something could survive in a world that was dying. He had come to her after the ruin of the Holiday Towers in Los Angeles. Her signature project, two soaring glass spires, one 84 floors and the other 104, linked by graceful sky bridges. When the Hollywood quake struck, the buildings had endured the shaking just as they'd been designed to do, keeping their residents safe, while much of the city around them crumbled. But massive fires followed the quake, and the towers had not survived that. The fires that destroyed the Holiday Towers might have been part of the general inferno sparked by the Hollywood earthquake, but Susanna suspected otherwise. The towers had stood as a symbol of defiance amid the destruction, which might explain why they were brought low. The Martian obelisk was a symbol too. As Nathaniel and Susanna prepared to defend the obelisk, the absurdity of the situation of fighting to protect a monument no one will ever see of caring so much about a tombstone becomes apparent to Susanna. Look at us. Look at what we've come to. Invested in a monument no one will ever see. Squabbling over the possession of ruins while the world dies. This is where our hubris has brought us. But that was wrong, so she corrected herself. My hubris. Nate was an old man with a lifetime of emotions mapped on his well-worn face. In that complex terrain, it wasn't always easy to read his current feelings, but she thought she saw hurt there. He looked away before she could decide. A furtive movement. Nate, she asked in confusion. This project matters, he insisted, gazing at the obelisk. It's art, and it's memory, and it does matter. Of course, but only because it was all they had left. And Nathaniel is right. The obelisk is important. It would be a tragedy for it to be brought down. And as Susanna and Nathaniel wait for the rogue vehicle to arrive, a terrible thought dawns upon them. What if it isn't someone who wants to destroy the obelisk? What if it's someone who needs help? Nate shuffled into the room. She could see from his grim expression that he expected the worst. And what was the worst? A slight smile stole onto her lips as Nate sat beside her on the couch. The worst case is that someone had lived. Was it any wonder they were doomed? Nathaniel and Susanna eventually get into contact with the person driving the vehicle. She's a young mother named Tori Eastman. Her and her children are the last survivors of the Red Oasis colony. After the collapse of Red Oasis, Tori drove 5,000 kilometers across the Red Planet to the site of the Martian Obelisk so she could beg for help. Nathaniel says there's nothing they can do for her, but Susanna has an idea. They can save Tori and her children by using their equipment 
to construct a new base. Except there's a catch. The towels needed for this new home will take years to make. But of course, Susanna and Nathaniel already have plenty of tiles. They have a whole obelisk made of them. Susanna and Nathaniel are given a choice. They can save Tori and her kids, but to do so, they must first tear down the obelisk. And this isn't an easy choice. The obelisk is the last remnant of humanity. It's the tombstone for mankind. In a few years, when everyone else is dead, the obelisk will remain. A sign to the heavens that we existed. A piece of art, the final piece of art, preserved for hundreds of millennia. Doesn't that matter? Doesn't preserving art matter? Is it wrong to want the legacy of mankind to still exist after we are gone? You know what's interesting? You already live in a world where art is remembered. Art is preserved and shared more in the modern day than in any other point in history. And overall, that is probably a good thing. We are inundated with choices, with more art and music and film and books than we know what to do with. There are more masterpieces out there than there is time to experience them. And at least culturally, appreciation of old art and media has become the defining characteristic of our era. We live in the era of franchises and cinematic universes, and adaptations and reboots and legacy sequels. And to be clear, even though this nostalgia baiting has been tainted by corporate cynicism, at the heart of it is a love for old art. People love old movies, so they watch remakes. People love comics, so they watch movies adapting comics. The franchise era exists because people love and appreciate old art. And the ironic thing is, a lot of the new art born from this love is really bad and soulless. To be fair, there is more than enough non-franchise art. People are still making new things. People will always make new things because people like making things. I'm not saying that art is dead or anything. There is more beautiful, personal, meaningful art today than ever before. And hell, this dichotomy of franchises and real art is ridiculous. The franchise boom has given us some of the best pieces of media I have ever experienced. Things like Blade Runner 2049, Breath of the Wild, and Across the Spider-Verse. But it also gave us Ready Player One. Ready Player One makes me think Trevor Dubay had a point. You know, honestly, this section wasn't in the video originally, but the day I finished the script, as I was driving in for work, the song Take Me On came on, except it was the version from Ready Player One's trailer. And then I almost ran a red light because I was floored by the sudden realization that I needed to talk about it. So, in case you haven't read and or seen Ready Player One, most of the story takes place in a virtual reality video game called The Oasis. The creator of The Oasis, James Halliday, was really into 80s nerd culture, so The Oasis is filled to the brim with pop culture references. From a Doyle's perspective, this is because author Ernest Cline is incapable of writing a scene that isn't just characters standing there emotionlessly listing off things he thinks are cool. And in the case of the film adaptation, it has the bonus of allowing Warner Brothers to show off all of the profitable franchises they own to their stockholders. That studio has made three different films that are all basically just them listing off all the pop culture franchises they own, and only one of them is even remotely watchable. I actually really liked Ready Player One when I was in junior high, i.e. the target demographic. I checked the book out again when I was in college and was shocked at how incredibly not good it was. And the film captures the spirit of the book perfectly. The problem I have with Ready Player One is that it's about art, but it has nothing to say about the art it features besides going, Whoa, that's a good movie. Like, it features a recreation of The Shining, but that part of the movie isn't about isolation driving a man to madness. It's just a mediocre montage of the main characters running scared through the Overlook Hotel. Between its two incarnations, Ready Player One features scenes referencing Blade Runner, War Games, Monty Python, Back to the Future, Child's Play, 2112, Akira, The Tomb of Horrors, Voltron, and a million other things, but somehow it never has anything meaningful to say about any of these things beyond, hey, remember that thing? Wasn't it cool? Like, for fuck's sake, the climax of the movie has a scene where the main character uses the Iron Giant as a weapon, because apparently nobody who worked on the movie understood the point of the Iron Giant. Harriet from Wind Will Rove reminds me of Ernest Cline. 
This insistence that art be preserved, that we remember old pieces of media without any ability to explain why that art is good. Preservation without meaning. Pieces of art kept alive by stripping away the soul that made them art. The plot of Ready Player One centers on a treasure hunt created by James Halliday before he died, with his will saying that whoever solves it will be given billions of dollars in control over the Oasis. And it's interesting, despite the story taking place in the 2040s, none of the art is new. It's all shit from the 80s or earlier, with the occasional 90s or 2000s reference thrown in for flavor. It seems that, in the 30 plus years between when the book was written and when it takes place, no new art was created. And out of universe, this is because Ernest Klein didn't want to make up several decades of new pop culture, but in universe, it's because of Halliday. Because he made this world consisting only of his own nostalgia. Because he created this treasure hunt, this contest for billions of dollars, where you win by being able to recite the dialogue of war games and play Joust real good. The people of Ready Player One do not create new art. They do not make new songs or movies or games because of Halliday. Because he created a cyberpunk capitalist hellscape that set it up so that the only way to escape it was to play the video game Zorka Bunch. The struggling masses cannot afford to make new art or even care about existing art because they need to spend that time binge-watching Family Matters out of hope that maybe, possibly, it holds the key to Halliday's fortune. I struggle to express how much contempt I hold for this character. Fictional murderers are a dime a dozen, but I have never seen another story where a character so completely killed the very concept of human artistic expression. Halliday made a world free of creativity, a world of nothing but mindless consumption of pop culture. And not good pop culture, pop culture stripped free of any deeper meaning. The story treats him as being good but misguided, but what he did is disturbing. And he wants this devastation to continue. Halliday doesn't hand the Oasis over to Wade because he's kind or smart or heroic or qualified in any way. Wade is put in charge because he likes the same pop culture as Ernest Klein, because he is able to recite the script of war games and played a perfect game of Pac-Man. The cultural drought Halliday forged will continue for decades because all of the money in the world was just given to a dry piece of cardboard whose only defining characteristic is having seen the movie Back to the Future. Is this our future? These nerdy franchises control more and more of the market every year. Does that mean we are destined to end up in a world where original art has been abandoned out of dedication to old art? No. People will always make new art because they like making new art. As I said, original art is still being made. Remember, Wind Will Rove and The Martian Obelisk both came out in 2017, after the franchise boom. Ready Player One being bad does not mean humanity is doomed. But, if we did live in the world of Ready Player One, we would need someone like Trevor Dubay to come along and destroy everything. We would need the mighty works of Ozymandias to crumble, leaving behind only desert, because only then could we build something new. The turning point of Wind Will Rove comes at one of the weekly band performances, when Rosie is given a chance to play Wind Will Rove. Except, she doesn't play it, not the way it's supposed to be played. No matter how many times you play a song, it isn't the same song twice. I was still thinking about Nelson's graffiti, and how the past never felt like a lie to me at all. It was a progression. Wind Will Rove said we are born anew every time a bow touches fiddle strings in an old-time session on a starship in this particular way. It is not the ship nor the session, nor the bow nor the fiddle that births us, nor the hands. It's the combination of all these things in a particular way they haven't been combined before. We are an alteration on an old, old tune. We are body and body, wood and flesh. We are bow and fiddle and hands, and memory and starship in old time. Wind Will Rove spoke to me, and my eyes closed to feel the wind the way my grandmother did, out on a cliff above the ocean. We cycled through the A part, the B part three times, four times, five. And because I closed my eyes, because I was in the song and not in the room, I didn't catch Harriet's signal for the last go-around. Everyone ended together except me. Even worse, I deviated. Between the bars of my unexpected solo, when my own playing stood exposed against the silence, I realized I diverged from the tune. It was still Wind Will Rove, or close to it, but I'd elevated the third bar into the fourth, a swooping, soaring accident. 
Here it gave me a look I interpreted as a cross between exasperation and reprobation. I'd used a similar one on my students before, but it had been a long time since I'd been on the receiving end. Sorry, I said, mostly sorry the sensation had gone, that I'd lost the wind. I slipped out the door early, while everyone was still playing. I didn't want to talk to Harriet. Back home, I tried to recreate my mistake. I heard it in my head, but I never quite made it happen again. And after half an hour, I put away the fiddle. For the first time, Rosie feels the wind. She understands the meaning behind the song. And she is only able to do so thanks to her conversations with Nelson and memories of Natalie. Rosie is only able to see the beauty in art by abandoning pure recitation, by making something new, by synthesizing, just as her daughter did years ago. Ultimately, Susanna decides to tear down the obelisk to save Tori and her children. Because it's the right thing to do. Nathaniel is less than happy. He looked at her in shock, struck speechless. It'll be okay, Nate. You're abandoning the project. If we can help this family survive, we have to do it. And that will be the project we're remembered for. Even if there's no one left to remember, she pressed her lips tightly together, contemplating the image of the obelisk. Then she nodded. Even so. Nathaniel points out that this isn't salvation. No one is going to rescue Tori. Her and her children will spend the rest of their lives alone on a dead planet, waiting for death, assuming they don't die suddenly like the others from Red Oasis. He was a friend, and she tried to comfort him. Nate, I'm sorry, if there was a choice, there isn't. That's the way it turned out. You will tear down the obelisk, and this woman, Tori Eastman, will live another year, maybe two. Then the equipment will break, and she will die, and we won't be able to rebuild the tower. We'll pass on, and the rest of the world will follow. We can't know that, Nate. Not for sure. He shook his head. This all looks like hope, but it's a trick. It's fate cheating us, forcing us to fold our hand, level our pride, and go out meekly. And there's no choice in it, because it's the right thing to do. The obelisk mattered, and now it's gone. And now, when humanity perishes, so will every sign we ever existed. Because of Susanna's kindness... Mankind will be forgotten. All that will remain is bare level sand, stretching far away, without even a sneering statue to say something once existed. Or will it? Susanna dedicates herself to the obelisk because she has lost all hope. Because she believes that the world cannot be saved. But seeing Tori Eastman's impossible journey, it awakens something deep within her. A belief that the world can be better. A belief in the ability of humans to take care of one another. The Martian obelisk ends with the following words. And then there was Tori Eastman of Mars, who had left a dying colony and driven an impossible distance past doubt and despair, because she knew you have to do everything you can until you can't anymore. Susanna had forgotten that, somewhere in the dark years. She sat for a time in the stillness, in a quiet so deep she could hear the beating of her heart. This all looks like hope. Indeed it did, and she well knew that hope could be a duplicitous gift from the master torturer, one that opened the door to despair. But it doesn't have to be that way, she whispered to the empty room. I'm not done. Not yet. Wind Will Rove is a story about a song, but it isn't just about the song. It's about the history of the song, the different people who work to preserve and recreate it. It's about remixes and transformations of the song. It's about songs played in the dark, unrecorded so they may live on only in the heads of the musicians who made them. All of that is part of the story. All of that matters. Rosie eventually finds Windwell Rove in the database because she knows its history, because she knows about years of remixes and recreations. At the end of the novelette, Rosie plays Windwell Rove, but not just the version her grandmother made her memorize as a child. She plays her remix. She plays Windy Grove and Windwell Rome. She plays it all tried to make the song sound like something more than wind. What did any of us know of wind? Nothing but words on a screen. I willed our entire ship into the new song I created. We were the wind. We were the wind and born by the wind, transmitted. I played the ship traveling through the vacuum. I played life on the ship. Footsteps on familiar streets. People, goats, frustration, movement while standing still. She records her version, names it We Will Rove, and adds it to the database so others may someday hear it. But she doesn't just keep playing it, she continues altering it, knowing others will change Windwell Rove after she is gone. 
And that's good. That's why she thinks art should be passed on. Because we change it, and it changes us. I'm working more changes into the song, making it more and more my own. I close my eyes when I play it, picturing a through line, picturing how one day, long after I'm gone, a door will open. Children will spill from the ship and into the bright sun of a new place. And somebody will lift my old fiddle, my grandmother's fiddle, and put a new tune to the wind. I don't have an answer to the questions asked in this essay. I don't know if an answer even exists. Maybe it's bad for art to survive. Maybe the franchisation of culture is stifling. Maybe for art to have meaning, it must be ephemeral. Deep down, I don't think this is true. I want my own art to be shared and experienced by new people. I want it to exist after I'm gone. I stopped the podcast, but I still make D&D story videos, dredging up those old private moments so an audience can relive them because I am afraid of those memories being lost. And perhaps that makes me prideful like Ozymandias. But then again, Ozymandias never talks about his works, other than commanding others to despair at them. He doesn't really care about art, he cares about his pride. Rosie, her mother, Natalie, Harriet, Susanna, and Nathaniel, the guys hunting for the most mysterious song, Banksy and Azevedo, even Halliday, if I am being charitable, they all care about art. Not because it is preserved, but because it is art. Perhaps the important thing is not whether art is preserved, but how it makes us feel. Perhaps the important thing is the impact it has on us, the meaning a master painter weaves into every brushstroke. The feeling of wind blowing through a forest, the feeling of mystery and the drive to solve it, the feeling of nostalgia, of being a kid and seeing a movie that changes your life, the feeling of grief and hopelessness, of doing everything you can until you can't anymore, the feeling of ephemera, of watching ice melt away into nothing just as, inevitably, we too will disappear, the feeling of having fun with your friends around a table. These feelings, the meaning behind art, that is what makes it special. It's what makes us human. Dab, 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 the video's over, sorry I'm dabbing.